Okay, so next we have our second Stuart of the evening. Um, Stuart Brown is a policy implementation specialist who has worked alongside the EU and third countries in the negotiation and implementation of free trade agreements. Amongst his many roles, Stuart has acted as EU high-level policy advisor to the Minister of the Env Environment of the Republic of Moldova and worked on the implementation relating to the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement between the EU and Moldova and the EU-Vietnam free trade agreement. So I'm really pleased to welcome Stuart Brown. Is that better? That's better. That's better. That's better. All right. Okay. First of all, let me thank you, Chris. Let me dispel one um, one possible um, notion. I'm not here to speak um, as a remainer. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is put myself in the position of someone who is tasked with implementing Brexit as a policy, and go through a number of basic essential planning considerations that a person in that position would have to take on board in order to make a success of the task. Um, I'm not going to make any predictions, I'm not going to make any projections, forecasts, whatever. I'm simply going to tell you what I know from my experience and leave it to you to work out whether or not that applies to the future and if so, how and what you can do about it. Okay. Um, Imagine you're discussing a house extension with an architect, and he says to you, you know, you, you need a supporting steel here, otherwise your house could collapse. He's actually stating what to him is obvious, um, so that you're aware of the risks, basically. Um, he's not trying to scare you into not proceeding with the work. Um, and there are things that are obvious to, to, to Jason and me because, we, because of the work we do, um, because we, we encounter these things all the time. And these are things that, that in fact, apply to Brexit. So, so this evening, both of us, we're going to share with you some of these things. And to get us all on the same page, I want to run through a number of, of basic principles. I appreciate that some of these things will be obvious to some of you, but possibly not to everybody. So please bear with me. Um, first of all, some essential principles that govern what may or may not be possible, and if it is possible, how long it takes to do it. Brexit is like any other concept insofar as you can do it successfully only if you define what you want to achieve and verify that it's achievable after taking everything into account and then plan realistically how to implement it. There's no getting away from those principles. You know, you, you can say what you like about Brexit, but those principles apply, whether we, whether we like it or not. Um, in the jargon of government, a policy is what you want to happen. A policy implementation plan is how you're going to make it happen, starting from where you are. Um, you know, what you're going to do, when, what sequence, with what resources, recognizing what you can or can't control, and how to limit the damage in case things go in a wrong direction. We need to understand this thing called implementation risk. Now, implementation risk arises whenever you make assumptions or believe things that you're not certain about. It's essential to be realistic when you're planning. How likely is it that an assumption is going to be wrong how can you minimize the likelihood that an assumption is going to be wrong? What would be the damage if the assumption proves to be wrong? And what, if anything, could you in such a situation do in order to limit the damage? I'll give you a few examples of assumptions. Striking an EU trade deal will be the easiest in history. Liam Fox, 20th of July, 2007, 2017, BBC Radio 4. Likelihood of being wrong, almost certain. Potential damage, very significant. Conclusion, not an assumption that I would really like to be, to have attributed to me. We can flourish on WTO terms, Jacob Rees-Mogg. 23rd of August, 2018, BBC. One can say unequivocally 
that the UK could not survive as a trading nation by relying on the WTO option. It would be an unmitigated disaster and no responsible government should allow it. The option should be rejected. It wasn't a Remainer that said that. It was the Leave Alliance on the 13th of March, 2017. So how do you plan for risk? For each risk, the government has to either put in place a viable contingency plan to mitigate that risk or explain to the country the consequences of the risk actually materializing. That is actually what Dominic Raab has been doing these last few weeks. No government worthy of office should ignore risk in its planning or imply to the country that a risk does not exist. And there are two things to remember. Policy implementation planning is basically applied common sense. There's nothing magical or mysterious about it. And in that respect, you're likely to get into trouble if you make an assumption about something that is outside of your control, or you can't guarantee being able to do what you need to do by the time you need to do it with the resources that you actually have available in order to do it. It's basic project management. These principles that I've outlined apply to the implementation of any project, any policy. So, let's ask how these principles apply to Brexit. Bear in mind, I'm, I'm a Brexiteer, I want to make Brexit work. What is Brexit? It's actually a basket of po different policies. It's not, it's not one single policy, it's a basket of interlinked things. It's a statement of what the UK wants to achieve with many subcomponents. It involves a lot of assumptions, many of which depend on things over which we have absolutely no control whatsoever. In project management terms, that makes it both exceedingly complicated and exceedingly risky. So that's why it would be totally irresponsible of the government to just get on with it without taking all of these assumptions and risks fully into account and having contingency plans for all of them. To make a success of Brexit, I want to make a success of Brexit, remember, the UK needs an implementation plan that has clearly defined and specific objectives, starts from where we actually are, not where we wish we were or think we were or believe we are, that respects applicable realities and constraints, and most importantly, is able to sustain foreign trade by the time we cease to benefit from the EU's internal market and its external trade agreements. Brexit needs to be coherent. It needs to respect all applicable realities, and Jason will be talking about some of those, and if it can be implemented without detriment to other areas of policy before any time-critical deadlines with the resources that are actually available at the time you need them to be available. So the key question is this. I want to share with you a few of the things I've learned through my work which might help you to answer this question. Are you confident that the UK government has a Brexit implementation plan that fulfills all of the aforementioned criteria. <laughs> I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Before I do, though, let's stop using this expression, strike trade deals. The people from Bath will be aware of this. A bilateral international trade agreement goes way, way beyond a business deal. An enormous amount of work goes into it, into negotiating and implementing it. I know because I've done it. So let's not trivialize that. Where most people go wrong in talking about 
Brexit is this. Almost all discussion about Brexit revolves around the question of whether or not we're going to be better off. In other words, people are focused on the medium to long term. This overlooks one rather obvious fact. To get to the medium term, we have to survive the short term. The reality is this. It's not going to be medium to long term economic outlook that determines whether we sink or swim. It's going to be short term cash flow issues. In other words, for the foreseeable future, this country's prospects depend critically on the timing of things and the time needed to complete certain processes. And the sequence of events is this. The UK invokes Article 50 of the Lisbon Treaty. Done. It then has to negotiate the terms of its withdrawal from the EU. That has nothing to do with trade. Negotiations with the EU on trade commence only after a withdrawal agreement is signed. That means that in a no-deal scenario, there would be no basis for proceeding to discuss trade with the EU. However, if the UK and the EU conclude a withdrawal agreement and proceed to negotiate a trade agreement, how long, typically, do such negotiations take? Before answering that question, I want to bring up two words, convergence and divergence. You may recall somebody in Parliament saying that the UK's declared aim is managed divergence from the EU. All of the EU's free trade agreements with third countries to date require varying degrees of convergence varying degrees of alignment coming together. The UK wants to come apart, remember. So there is no precedent for the type of agreement that the UK wants, none. That is certainly going to complicate things. The two agreements that I've worked on most recently, Moldova and Vietnam, they're actually quite interesting because although they're based on different models, the amounts of time and work effort involved were in fact, broadly similar. In Moldova, the deep and comprehensive free trade agreement, it doesn't require a customs union, which is useful, and it allows Moldova to pursue its own trade policy, but it does require some regulatory alignment, particularly on, for example, environmental legislation. Timeline, the process was initiated in 2009, the main work phase, 2010-2013, came into effect towards the end of 2013. Vietnam. The EU-Vietnam Free Trade Agreement, which I've spent the last three years uh, on and off working on, it eliminates 99% plus of customs duties on goods. It includes a range of services also, including financial services, by the way. Uh, it does require alignment also, despite Vietnam's geographical distance, on, for example, forest law enforcement, government governance and trade, and the, on, in trade and trade in endangered species. Timeline, negotiations started 2012, ratification delayed to the end of 2017. So the facts are these, taking into account two other agreements that I've had some dealings with, Moldova, four years. Vietnam, five years. Japan, six years. Canada, eight years. We're talking about a long period of time that's not going to start until January 2019 at the earliest. How much work is actually involved in negotiating one of these agreements? Well, the answer is anything between eight and 18 person years, depending upon the the complexity of the task. In other words, you need a lot of people to do these, do these things, particularly if you're going to do a lot of them in parallel. The EU presently has more than 50 external trade agreements. And as a member state, the UK is able to trade outside the EU because of these agreements. 
in order to be able to maintain continuity of trade, remember, we need to negotiate and have in place, ratify agreements able to replace all of these in a sufficiently short period of time to prevent a significant section of the British economy from upping sticks and moving or going bankrupt. So what about WTO? Much of the talk has been about tariffs, but um, you know, non-tariff barriers are a much more critical issue to consider, I would suggest, when planning the transition from EU Britain to Brexit Britain. That's not opinion, that's fact. The Leave Alliance, again, for whom I have to give a vote of thanks for the many facts that I've included in this presentation. Um, the final reckoning, even assuming that other countries are willing to dance to the UK's tune, we still need to find enough trade negotiators to handle the workload of a large number of trade negotiations in parallel in a critically short period of time. So what do we conclude from all of this? Everything I've said, all of the concepts and the planning processes will be familiar to any project manager, and I guess we've, we've plenty of people here who've, who've done, done project management in their time. They're principles that, you know, big corporations put into practice every day of the year. And the starting point in each case has to be a sufficiently well-defined objective. Does our government have a sufficiently well-defined objective for Brexit? Clearly not, because otherwise they wouldn't be arguing among themselves about it. And you can't plan for something if you don't know exactly what that something is. Does it matter? You better believe it matters, big time. What about the WTO? Well, that you're about to find out. Thanks for your attention.